So what are you going to play for us? Uh, we're going to play some Charlie Parker. All right. Let's hear it. Take it away. Two. One, two, Ladies and gentlemen, that was Dr. Sean Thunder Wallace with one of his many television appearances, sharing his gift of jazz with the world. And I, this brother is so uh, such a craftsman that he probably feels insulted right now that I refer to it as a gift because I know in the back of his head he's thinking, man, I worked hard for that. <laughs> Dr. Thunder, what's happening, man? What's happening, man? How are you doing? Hey, man, I'm good, brother. I can't complain. I could, but, you know, it wouldn't do anybody any good. And it'd probably just get a bunch of people to agree with me, and then that would just drag me down. So I prefer to have my conversations up. Hey, man, <laughs> I'm, I want to talk with you about Jazz and Freedom today because um, there's this article that uh, creative director of Fee, Sean Malone, wrote, and I know you've you've read the article but it's called Taking a Lesson from Jazz, subtitled Libertarian Cooperation. And it just got me thinking about, about this thing that we call freedom, about this thing that we call liberty. And I feel like most conversations around those topics center around politics as if that's where all the action is. If you want to create change, you've got to do it in the realm of politics, right? Most conversations assume that. And so we kind of limit our... Uh, conversations about liberty to policies that uh, seem to be a threat to liberty, or perhaps policies that reverse the negative effects of policies that are a threat to liberty. And something that you and I share as a conviction is that the most underestimated force in history is the creative power of the individual. And I talk a lot about what that looks like in the realm of entrepreneurship as a theory of social change. But I love to have a conversation with you about what that looks like in the realm of the arts. So I want to talk a little bit about your career path, your history with the arts, what's your story, how you got how you came to be a jazz musician and things that you've learned. But particularly I like to know those insights from your story and maybe the history of jazz that people can use to create more freedom in their individual lives and in the world as a whole. You up for that conversation, man? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, so first of all, uh, this, um, this clip that you played, this is from about, oh man, everything is obscured because of the pandemic. YouTube says two years ago, three years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, um, uh, it was a really early morning appearance and, the guitar player was the headliner for that year's Ohio State Jazz Festival. And the keyboard player was one of my students at the time. And they weren't really set up for uh, professional miking or anything. So I'm actually like wearing like a lavalier mic on my lapel, but then that's what you're, that's how you're hearing the saxophone. Um, but it was a, it was a fun spot in the, um, they were very, uh, you know, warm and inviting and, and, uh, didn't seem to be particularly phony, like some of the sort of media personalities when you actually get to meet them in person. Sometimes it is the case that they uh, aren't as smiley, but they were still smiley, <laughs> even, even when the camera was off. Um, and I read that article uh, the article we're referring to now and interesting, it was an inter interesting argue, uh, article, 
uh, interesting take, uh, sort of a way to use one's own sort of experience in the arts as a way to uh, uh, maybe provide some guidance as to what, you know, libertarianism could be, you know, um, and maybe some of the ways that it fails, um, at least how it exists now. So I, I thought that was a interesting article. And interestingly enough, last night I, I interviewed um, uh, Dr. Peter Butenev, who is the, uh, he's professor of uh, theology at St. At Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary. But he's also a jazz musician. And so it was sort of an interesting kind of conversation uh, on how uh, jazz uh, seems to be very much congruent even with uh, the study of theology. Because um, everything's about establishing parameters. That tune that I played is a Charlie Parker composition called Billy's Mounts. And it's a blues. In a blues, the sort of traditional blues, uh, uh, the kind of uh, Charlie Parker blues, the standard blues, is a 12-bar form. And that bar, that that 12-bar form continues to recycle over and over. And uh, blues can be uh, a sort of good initiation into starting to learn how to improvise, but it can also be the most challenging thing you do. You know, if you listen to someone like John Coltrane play on a blues, or of course, Charlie Parker play on a blues. And, uh, but what makes it interesting is we didn't do a whole lot of rehearsing, right, for that. I mean, we played it through a couple times, but all of us knew the blues. All of us had already sort of done the, uh, you know, previous study so that we knew what it was that we're talking about. And it was that condition, uh, that sort of set of preconditions that set us up to have a successful performance. Um, one thing about jazz that's very interesting is uh, the ability to pretty much go anywhere uh, and find, you know, good jazz musicians and without even rehearsing to be able to play. And one of the reasons for that is because we all have this sort of precision in this um, precision is not the right word. We all have this. We've done our homework. We've done our studying on what the forms are of, of these, you know, great American songbook and jazz standards. So we know all of this music and we've likely shared hundreds of, of records in common. So when we get together to actually play, often is the case that it's as if you've been playing together, you know, for a long time because you've been listening to the same stuff. And so I think there's this sort of like community approach, you know, Miles Davis famously, famously or infamously has said, you know, don't call it jazz. He says, he says, call it social music. And that's because there's a community around the music. And there's this sort of collective approach to what's going on. And everyone is, uh, is an individual, but you're, uh, you're approaching the music, uh, from a more of collective sort of perspective where everyone's voice contributes, but where the body of musical knowledge, the tradition, you know, that, that always has a primacy that always um, is more important. It always outweighs whatever your individual, um, whatever your individual thing is. Um, and it can take a long time to develop your own voice because it's not just your own voice, um, out of nothingness, you know, it is your own voice given the tradition. 
Mm -hmm. right? So the tradition would be the way that you would evaluate if your voice is valid. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's much different than just, you know, playing some spastic stuff and say, hey, nobody's played that particular collection of notes with that precise timing before, so I'm an individual now. No, it's really understanding, you know, um, the tradition, really understanding, you know, the box that we're all in. There is this box, there is this structure. Um, understanding the structure is the only way to really thoroughly manipulate the structure and then therefore understand um, what actually is new because you thoroughly know what's inside the box, you know, and so yeah, that can take a lifetime. Not, yeah. It's not that, that the new is dangerous, but it is dangerous to think you're doing something new when you're not right. It's, it's, it's the illusion that I am doing something new that arises out of an ignorance of history that that's the dangerous part yeah. and you're making me think of of uh, the concept c.s lewis talked about chronological snobbery where you you oh. determine the value of something based on how old or new it is and you see a lot of that in the form of recency bias today where if something comes from the past it's just automatically held up to this kind of scrutiny that new things are not held up to. And there's kind of this rejection of history, rejection of the past, rejection of tradition um, without understanding why certain traditions have lasted for so long, without understanding that things stand the test of time because they solve real problems and have something valuable to offer humanity. And it's so important to kind of hang on to those things. And something that we're seeing with the so-called culture wars right now is what I take to be a, a bit of chronological snobbery, uh, a tendency to move on so quickly to a new era, a new way that, that we fail to pause and say, well, wait a minute now. Creativity and improvisation requires the structure that is provided to us by tradition. What is useful to us from tradition? We can challenge tradition. We can question it, but we first have to understand what it is. We have to acknowledge it first. And I, and I love that about jazz. And so I, I want to go back into your story because I want to ask this about how you got introduced to jazz. I mean, it's not like any other form of music. It's It's got this longstanding history. It's respected in academia. And there are these kind of like niche markets where you get the impression that these sophisticated intellectuals or wealthy people appreciate jazz. But it's not like pop music today. It's It, it seems to never be the most popular thing. So... I'm curious to know, one, how you got into jazz, who introduced it to you, and two, why is jazz this kind of esoteric thing to most people? Yeah, so, I mean, my dad, you know, uh, so my dad was a great saxophone player, um, yeah. and he, he uh, owned his own record company. Uh, Majawa Productions, and my most of my records, my CDs are are under that label. And uh, he was a great saxophone player, and so I heard him practicing around the house, and I heard that a lot, and I became really interested in it. And so I kept begging him to teach me to play. And finally, I guess I started when I was around two or three or something. And so finally, when I was six, he said, okay, we'll, we'll teach you how to play. So, and notice the use of the word play. And I realized this just now, the way that I'm talking about it, because that's something that he conditioned in me that music was playing that playing jazz, playing jazz, you know, that word play. Cause I started when I was really young and whenever it was time for a lesson or whenever it was time for us to 
um, play our instruments. He didn't say, go get your instrument and let's practice. He said, go get your instruments and let's play. Hmm. And so, you know, and, and still to this day, I, I, I favor that. Uh, you know, that was a really clever strategy <laughs> that he, that he used. But, you know, there's this playfulness in the music. Um, you know, all I wanted to do was play. You know, once I, once I, you know, I was a kid. You know, of course, kids want to play. And so he was able to sort of repurpose or sort of channel that childlike playfulness into playing the instrument. And so that's what I, that's what I did. I played, I played a lot. Um, and, uh, at times I think they were concerned that maybe I was playing too much. And so they were like, okay, but you go outside, you go play with your friends, you go do something else. And, um, I remember times where my brother, so I have an older brother, um, and he would, so I'd climb up a tree and I'd sit on the branch and then he'd take the saxophone and push it up to me. And I would sit up in the tree for hours. And I was, there are, were, um, so I grew up in the country and there was this 80 acre cow pasture behind my house. And there were these treetops in a, in a sort of forested area that was um, on one side in particular. And I would improvise to describe the contour that I saw in the treetops, you know? So, so that Wait, was sort it of like an assignment dictated. he gave you or you came up with this on your own? No, I came up with that on my own. Um, hmm. But... Being out in the country, it facilitated a lot of that kind of thing. I remember I would take my horn um, and go by where the cow pasture was, which was like, you know, there was the fence. It was our yard, and yeah. the, on the other side of the yard was the cow pasture. So, and it was a dairy farmer. So the cows would, you know, they would come up to the, the fence when they, you know, I, I'd be up there playing. They'd come up to the fence. It's like, what's going on with this, you know? So there's all all, all that kind of stuff. and. Um, and although I think my tendency is not to look towards those kinds of things as some magical point of inspiration or something, I do realize reflecting back on them that they were important points, mm. you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, so that's, that's how I started. And then, you know, I started composing right alongside playing, you know, uh, uh, playing by ear and, and, um, you know, out of etude books and, um, listening to music. You know, I didn't listen to a whole lot of music when I first got started because my dad was, wanted me to be able to develop my own voice, um, and have sort of an idea. Obviously I was influenced by him. Um, but to, he wanted to, to give me the sort of precondition to be able to gravitate towards something because I had had an idea of my own identity first, you know? And so, but I still started listening to uh, other, um, uh, other musicians, you know, pretty, pretty soon, maybe 10 or something like that. Um, and wow. yeah, I mean, that was, that was it. Yep. You recorded your first album at what age? Uh, 14. And you, you, you grew up around a lot of like being in the scene though, right? The picture you just painted is you and your dad, you're in the shed. You're not really listening to other people. You're developing your own voice, but at a pretty early age, you were immersed in an environment where you're around a lot of the big players and names of jazz. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I think the first, uh, the, I think the first two saxophone players that I really gravitated towards were Sonny Stitt and Paquito D. Rivera. 
And Paquito de Rivera, actually, I had the uh, great pleasure of interviewing him on my Conversations with Dr. Thunder series. And uh, that was a, was like pinching myself the whole time. Um, but Paquito had an unusual control of the instrument. So when I, when I asked him about his uh, altissimal uh, control and range, um, which immediately you know it, it's him because of the sort of fluidity that he plays up in the upper register. Um, uh, he started out by playing soprano saxophone because the soprano saxophone was smaller. So, um, so a, a younger kid could play it. But then what happened when he transitioned to alto, which is a lower register instrument, he was still hearing notes up in the upper register. And mm. so he developed all of this facility, um, unusual facility up, mm. up in that range. And a lot of the music that, um, um, you know, Piquito play a lot of the, you know, Latin jazz, um, there's a sort of primacy of like trumpet and trumpet is always playing really high up there. And so he, he could match all of the, all of that stuff, you know, all of any of that stuff up there. So he developed all of that kind of facility. And so that really stuck out and made me want to develop that kind of facility myself on the instrument. And Sonny Stitt, um, his precision um, and his method methodical, surgical, no, no BS, always playing the right stuff, always precise. Um, and, but at the same time, sounded so fresh sounded like it was the first time he had played anything, you know, it just sounded yeah. like he was, uh, had this melodicism and, um, you know, imagination that was just like wide open, but everything that he played was surgically accurate. It was all of the correct stuff. He had done all of his homework. He yeah. loved Charlie Parker, you know, um, but he had done all of his homework and he was playing all of the right stuff. I mean, it, it would stand up to any kind of scrutiny. And uh, so, but Sonny Stitt became a real strong influence on me. Uh, it wasn't until I went to college that Coltrane became more of an influence on my playing. But yeah, I mean, and then my dad always had me playing with the greatest musicians around. So when I was a kid, um, in addition to playing with a lot of the great musicians in Lansing, I spent a lot of time in Detroit where there's a lot of great musicians in folks that I still have close relationships with people like Vincent Chandler, um, mm -hmm. and Dwight Adams, um, uh, people like Marcus Belgrave, uh, people like Ralph Armstrong, um, Rodney Whitaker. Um, I mean, I, I can just keep going on and on. I mean, um, Eddie Russ. Well, well to, to that point really quickly, um, you have a show where you've interviewed a lot of these cats. Am I right? Like a lot of the cats that you've played with or that you've looked up to in the jazz space. Yeah. Ralph Armstrong, uh, uh, Dwight Adams and Vincent Chandler I've interviewed all of them. And, um, Unfortunately, um, uh, Marcus Belgrave passed away years ago. Um, but you know, he, he had a, you know, lasting impact and, and he, and he was the mentor of a lot of guys, a lot of musicians. I mean, Winton, uh, you know, uh, Marcus was Winton's teacher, you know, at least at one point. Yeah. What did, what did you learn? Like, Give me your top maybe two or three lessons you learned from those cats just spending time around a lot of the big jazz heads, especially at an earlier age. And, and, and I'd, be, I'd be curious to know in terms of like finding your way in the world or life itself. Yeah. So um, Vincent Chandler, 
Vincent Chandler taught me the diminished scale. And it's interesting because when he taught me that scale, uh, I was playing things that implied that I knew the scale, but I didn't actually know the scale. And so I always credit him for teaching me that scale. And th that's a, that's a, that's a very important scale to know. Um, and, you know, in jazz harmony without getting too, uh, too sort of specific, um, in sort of jargony, I'll just say it's a, it's a very important, uh, scale. Uh, so anywhere from teaching me just things about the music and the theory of the music itself to sort of teaching me about, um, you know, how to approach, you know, you know, how, do, how do you play a gig? How do you, you know, what, what are the sort of protocols and, uh, you know, and even introducing me to other musicians that, you know, they thought that, Hey, you know, you know, you know, you would really dig this guy, you know, turning me on to recordings. It's like, Hey, have you listened to this one? You know, one thing about Dwight Adams, for instance, um, now I've learned a lot from Dwight because Dwight was my old gym partner and Dwight was Mr. Michigan. It's an open bodybuilding competition, the state of Michigan. And, uh, so around the time that he had won that competition, we started, he started teaching me. What well, was it? Some years after that, but he started teaching me. And so I was in the gym with him. I just, my workout routine to this day is basically his workout routine with some modifications. So we had a lot in common with that and, uh, spirituality, having conversations about that. But in terms of jazz, he's always listening to stuff. It's always new stuff. He's always turning me on yeah. to something to this day. I mean, I'll get on the phone with him. Hey man, have you checked out? Such and such is recording. It's like, no, I haven't checked that out yet, you know? And so then I'll go in, I'll go and check it out. He's just one of those guys. He's super open. Um, but he's not one of these like new age open where everything has sort of lost its meaning. Like everything's about the same amount of meaning, <laughs> you know, yeah. he, he still, you know, has a, a clear, this is correct. This is not correct. This is how you do this. This is not how you do it. There's, there's very clear standards, but he's very open in us. Um, so, you know, learning that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Like he's, but, he's always, always been inspired by other people's work, other people who are playing well and, and right. yeah, doing awesome things. And, and I remember hearing, uh, this is Lawrence Fishburne on Inside the Actor Studio. And he was saying one of the most important things for artists to do is to create space to be inspired by other artists' work. And it can be so easy yeah. to kind of become artistically narcissistic where you're only in tune with your projects and the things that you're promoting. And you can just forget to watch plays and movies with other actors, you know, with different styles yeah. from you to listen to music by musicians that are different from you and to keep that part of you alive that made you want to perform in the in the first place. And that's the ability to see another person besides yourself make magic happen. That's so key, you know? You know, I was watching, um, oh, I'll, th I'll think of his name in a, in a little bit. I'll, t I'll tell you who it is. He's the uh, saxophone player with Snarky Puppy. Um, I'll think of, I'll think of his name in, in a, in a minute. Um, but I was watching his, his YouTube channel and he was talking about the, the, the pandemic. And he was talking about how, you know, we had this sort of idealized thing. I mean, I, I heard so much stuff like, especially towards the middle, sorry, towards the beginning of the pandemic where people were trying to put this positive spin on this extra amount of time that all these artists are getting now and how much, how much great art that's going to be created during this period and, and how much better musicians that folks are going to be and everything. And, and he was willing to admit that, no, that's not actually what's, what's happened. You know, it's like, 
because <laughs> because inspiration is such like a an important part in interacting with other musicians. I know that my my composition um, and my playing is so inspired, influenced by the the people that I play with, and yeah. I you know you try to think that you're an island and hey I can do all this stuff within myself, but no, that's not really the way it works. And fortunately, I've been able to play frequently with my quartet, Dr. Thunder Quartet, even through the pandemic, kind of starting back in, in, um, in August. Um, uh, and every time we play together, I've got a gig coming up this Thursday. It's just, everybody is really listening to each other and really inspired and, you know, is doing things that they wouldn't have done in a, in a different context. And it just makes it so, um, such an enjoyable experience. And, and then it's not just the music, but it's like the, the ongoing conversation, you know, like I don't have to like set anything up with them. You know, it's like, it's like the relationship that you and I have, I could send you the middle of a sentence, three words, and you'd know exactly what I'm talking about. Right. 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 Because we have all of this, this history we 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 know we and we've discussed in and sort of dug deep in certain areas and so we yeah. know we you know we know what we're talking about and that that just uh it's such a exhilarating you know it's such an exhilarating uh experience to be able to combine that with something that uh is is aesthetically beautiful like jazz is. Yeah. As a musician, man, I know you take up a deep interest in politics and personal development. A lot of these different topics come up. We've even talked about a lot of them here. I'm curious about your thoughts on the contributions that side of your life has played in in this pursuit and promotion of, of freedom. Yeah. You know, I think one thing that jazz has done for me is that it's developed my ability to pretty quickly, uh, get a feel for my surroundings, you know? So, I am, I'm okay with making mistakes, you know, uh, now, yeah, (laughs) jazz is not really about making mistakes by the way, but as, uh, Miles Davis would frequently say, you, you know, it's not, it's not the note that you're currently playing. It's the next note. And so the next note can always justify the note that you're playing. Hmm. Right. It always can justify or it can dim or it can condemn you. <laughs> right. So uh, say if I'm playing a note that seems to be outside of the state of tonality, outside of the key that I'm playing in. It, if the next note is a strong note within the state of tonality, uh, particularly by a half step approach, then it will just sound like a chromaticism. So it can sound clever, you know, Mm. but if I play that same note that's outside of the state of tonality, and then I get freaked out by that note, um, then it's just going to sound like a wrong note, you know? And so, um, Mm. so it's developing the sort of, uh, you know, flexibility to be able to pivot, to be able to change your orientation, um, quickly, you know, uh, there are certain sets of chord changes that are particularly challenging to play on. So for instance, uh, uh, one such chord progression, uh, is over the John Coltrane composition, giant steps. 
And Giant Steps is one of these sort of proving grounds. Um, at some point, you're going to have to face that, you know, at that tune. And your ability to sort of manage all of the uh, all of the key changes, all of the you know tonality shifts, you know, even within the same measure, you know, but still be able to say something meaningful given the, given those sort of constraints and constraints that are not. Um, usual con constraints or not, but key relationships that are often mediant relationships, which are particularly challenging for you to hear naturally and to connect, you know? So if you can develop a fluidity with things that have those kinds of shifts and cause you to uh, learn how to reorient yourself uh, frequently, I think that's a skill that perhaps can be useful in approaching everything else, you know? So, and even in a conversation, which is nothing but an improvisation, by the way, unless it's all scripted. And of course this conversation is not, but it's, it's, it's improvised. It's, you know, you say something, I'm not sure what you're going to say. And I'm trying to, relate to what it is that you're saying, but also add something that, you know, shows that I understand where you're coming from, but that also adds something that we can continue to develop and, and grow and build, continue to build the, the conversation upon. So I think there's, there's so much uh, that can be learned and those sort of basic building blocks, uh, especially learning how to be be flexible in how to hold things loosely, you know, <laughs> how to sort of respond in the moment as opposed to needing everything to be sort of already laid out. Now, now see, now see this, but this is, this is where I think some folks get in trouble because the reason uh, that I'm able to improvise over giant steps is because I know that form so well, and I've struggled with with it for so long. Uh, I know it inside and out, so that's how I can sound like I'm free as I'm improvising over it. Mm. Uh, and the same thing in any kind of conversation, you you encounter certain topics where, eh, I don't really know anything about that, so it's not the topic that I'm going to discuss with very much. <laughs> <laughs> detail, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Or I'm going to take that question, but I'm going to take it to mean something that I'm pretty sure they didn't exactly intend, but I know it's something that I can actually talk about, you know, so maybe you modulate a, a bit to keep the conversation moving because maybe it goes to a subject that you don't know as much about, but you know something about this other subject, which has some things in common, right? So, there's all of these opportunities to go different directions in conversation. And when you're like learning new disciplines, um, you know, at some level, everything is sort of the same process. There's the same phenomena, the same uh, stumbling blocks, the same struggles, the same tendency to plateau at some level of your development and the same need to push through that plateau long enough for you to can to start your your trajectory again yeah, you know yeah and it's all the same stuff it's all the same stuff you know yeah i mean that's one of the reasons why i encourage people especially at an earlier age to not trouble themselves too early about what they want to do for the rest of their lives but to just focus on those things that are interesting to them and and go deep and really master something like if you're if you're interested in learning an instrument or a new language or becoming good at a sport, go deep on that because it may very well be the case. It's likely the case that in five years your interest will be on to something different, but you will have learned how to learn. And that is a transferable skill. Yeah. 
you know, so right. when I think about my childhood, all the lessons I learned from competitive sports, all the lessons I learned from trying to write songs, that stuff is transferable. And, and today when I face challenges or when I want to figure out something new, I go back to the earliest lessons I learned from those days playing sports or something like that or doing theater. And I'm able to transfer that to what I want to master today. And so learning how to learn is a very valuable skill and it doesn't really matter what you use that on as, as, as long as it's within, you know, certain moral boundaries, but mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter what you use that. <laughs> you got, you got to get that. Right. Right. You can, you can, right. Right. You, you could use that skill to become like a really, really good, like a uh, burglar or something. Like you, you can you can do some good bank robbing with that, or 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 uh, uh, mining mining cryptocurrency or something. Um, uh, <laughs> Bob Reynolds, that's the saxophonist uh, that yeah. that I that I couldn't remember his name. Sorry, Bob. But uh, we had a we had a great conversation. But like I said, recently he put out a, a video where he was confessing that. He wasn't exactly where he thought he'd be or where he would want to be. But what he talked about was returning to his, you know, sort of some of the some of the first things that he remembers experiencing that kind of got him turned on about the music, returning yeah. to those things. And um, he loves Chris Potter. Of course, we all love Chris Potter. It was uh, tremendous. Um, very influential, influential, modern tenor player. Um, and so on that same sort of video, he has him basically relearning a Chris Potter solo, you know, and he's learning it phrase by phrase. And it's just, uh, it's interesting that that, you know, that, that sort of strategy, uh, that that's the same strategy that you're suggesting now. Um, and it's the, and it doesn't seem to matter what the discipline is, but it's the same process. If you get stuck, you get to a place where you feel stagnated, um, or maybe you've been away from what it is that you've wanted to do for a while. Just, just, just go back to the beginning. You know, what, what, what got you into it? What, what were some of the earliest things that you can remember? And then try to retrace your path. And it's likely that a lot of those things will kind of get you going again. Yeah. I love that, man. Let me make, before we run out of time, let me make a few uh, statements that I know to be false about music, but I, I want <laughs> you to, uh, to respond to them. Number one, um, music is fun. It's great, you know, for, for recreation, but it doesn't actually change the world. If you want to change the world, don't go into the arts, go into something more pragmatic like business or politics. Yeah, this is interesting because right now, a lot of uh, institutions of higher learning, uh, uh, conservatories and schools of music are being forced to face themselves because... Um, it's possible to it's possible to become out of balance with those two sort of uh, you, you you sort of presented them like their their bookends, but uh, let me suggest that I, I think that you need to have a uh, a practical approach to your music so that you can um, uh, so that you can pursue a career that's that will be viable, and I think that conservatories are being forced to to recreate their sort of uh, uh, curriculums. Um, and they've also been forced to do a lot with what everyone has been forced to do, interfacing the way that we are right now and how much content can you deliver this way? So this is an interesting question that you ask. Of course, I think that if you love music, if you have to do it, if it is what you believe that you were created to do on the earth, then, then we need you. We need you to do what you, what you were created to do. Um, and you may not understand or know how things are going to work out, 
but you know, it's like that whole, uh, it's like that whole, you know, idea of one, one solo changing the world, you know, one 16 bar solo revolutionizing everything. And, uh, I mean, it's still there. It's still that, that possibility is still there. Um, you know, that, that whole thing about, um, playing at Carnegie hall or playing in the band of someone that you so admire, someone that's been, uh, so influential to your playing and finally getting the opportunity to play with them and, and what that is. I mean, there are still those big moments, uh, that are so important. Um, not just for you, but I mean, you're also sort of, uh, you're forging a path in so long as you don't hide your footprints, you hide, hide your steps, other people can follow. And so, so you're creating other possibilities and pathways for other people. Um, Mm -hmm. so yeah, music can be a hobby and it can be fun. Um, that's true. And it's also true that music, um, is, uh, a worthy, a worthwhile, uh, pursuit. So long as you need it, <laughs> you, you must do it. You, you are compelled. Um, I would also say though, that if you are not compelled and you're just doing it and going through the motions, let me suggest that you find the thing that really does turn you on and put your energy towards that. And by the way, I'll say that same thing about anything else, because people say that about the arts, but I think that's a standard you should hold yourself to with accounting. That's a standard you should hold yourself to with business major, with the poli sci major, uh, a sales career or anything else. If you're just going through the motions and doing this because someone told you that's a good job for a responsible adult to have, you are on the path to mediocrity. You are on your way to being someone who is easily replaceable because if your biggest asset is your ability to follow instructions on a to-do list without bringing anything unique or personal or creative to the table, then that means all we need to find is one other person who can do the same as you, but who's willing to get up an hour earlier or stay at work an hour later. And there's always someone who has more availability than you. So don't reduce your career or your life path to just your capacity to be a responsible adult who follows instructions in the name of working a good job. Bring yourself to the role or, and do something that makes it easy for yeah. you to bring all the different parts of yourself to the role. Or or work for less money. That's a strategy a strategy that people use. They say, hey, yeah. well, I'll I'll work longer hours and for less money. And I don't have a mortgage. I'm still living with my parents. I can, and so, so I can still live on love <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I hear you, man. I hear you. That, that's real talk right there, though. Yeah. That's real talk. Like being financially savvy involves two things. Number one, asking yourself, how can you maximize your, the health of your financial condition? But the second thing is, how can I minimize the degree to which my desired lifestyle depends on a flamboyant Mm. financial condition? You know, maximize the health of it. And at the same time, minimize your dependency on needing to have all the financial bells and whistles. And the good life is somewhere in the middle of that. I appreciate you going into your story, man, and sharing some of these ideas. One thing I'll, I'll toss out there for anybody that thinks... Music is a hobby. The arts are fun, but I got to go do something else if I want to change the world. I would say this. Take a look at every commercial you watch. Take a look at every significant political speech you watch. Take a look at every advertisement that all of the businesses run for their product. They can never pull it off without music, and they will never try. And the reason why is because they understand that no matter how good your ideas are, no matter how good your products are, you cannot make an impact on the world unless you can invoke people's feelings and stimulate their imagination. 
And because of that reason alone, the arts will always be indispensable. When you work in the arts, you are one of the people who gets to shape the culture. You are one of the people who gets to influence and inspire people to feel and dream in a certain way. And there's a response that you can get from the human heart with imagination and feeling that you simply can't get with argumentation and rhetoric. And so if you work in the arts, you have that kind of power. It's why Plato talked about the artist with such great fear, you know, saying you got to be careful with these mm -hmm. artists because they can make you imagine all sorts of things and they can make you feel all sorts of things. And that power can lead you astray, which is why he loved that philosopher king concept. But the artist can use that power for good. You take a good artist with a good philosophy. Wow the amount of power that you can have for good, the amount of freedom that you can create in your own life and other people's life. It'd be amazing. Dr. Thunder, man, I appreciate you taking you know, the time, brother. Oh, go ahead. oh absolutely, man. I, I was just going to say, I was just going to say, you know, and you yourself, I mean, you have a theater, theater background. And if people don't think that the theater background is related to the sort of precision that you communicate with, uh, I, I, you know, of course it's related. <laughs> it's directly related. Yeah, absolutely, man. And, and, and also just the willingness to put yourself out there, right? All of that stuff has to do with it. For those of you who yep. have been tuning in, checking out Thunder and I, we're going to switch things up. We're, we're going we're gonna to hit the pause button now and say, we're wrapping up this season of Thunder and TK. And we want to play around with doing more live conversations on social media, maybe IG or something like that. So we're going to recalibrate and regroup and play around with some different concepts and see uh, what else we can do to uh, continue bringing great conversations. Uh, and so stay tuned. Uh, keep listening. Uh, keep keep uh, tuned on the YouTube channel. Keep keep following us on Instagram and on Twitter, and we'll keep you uh, updated on the latest stuff having to do with Rev One. We will continue to bring you interesting and inspiring conversations and podcasts and so on. But you're tuning in to the finale of this season, and uh, we'll keep you in the loop with what's next. But thanks for tuning in. Thanks for supporting. Peace out, y'all. Stay free. <laughs>